Hello, this is Lindsay Clark. I'm your instructor for current topics in medical laboratory sciences. This is lecture number 16, laboratory function and basic equipment. And some of this will be a review for you all, but I do want you to know this information, so be sure you review everything here. The objectives for this lecture, number one, list measures taken by laboratories to control costs. Number two, describe basic laboratory equipment and discuss basic safety and maintenance of equipment. Number three, compare and contrast types of water used in the laboratory. Number four, recognize different types of pipettes and measurement devices routinely used in the laboratory. Number five, explain factors that affect pipetting accuracy. So as I was putting this lecture together, it seemed a little bit disjointed despite my best efforts. So my apologies for that. Um, here's a quick outline of this lecture. So we're going to briefly discuss laboratory economics, including cost savings, calculating costs, and equipment costs. Then we're gonna move on and discuss basic lab equipment, different types of lab water, and finally pipettes and pipetting. Laboratory economics are important because labs are often reimbursed at a lower rate than the cost of performing tests. So to maintain a balanced budget in the lab, cost control measures must be put in place. Now there are several methods for controlling costs. Around the 1960s, laboratories started running tests in panels, which was a less expensive way than running tests individually. This is still a cost-saving technique used today. And satellite labs, such as a stat lab near the emergency department, can offer quick turnaround times in areas where demand is high, and this allows for faster patient care. Reference labs can also help uh, la hospital labs save money, especially on high cost, low volume tests. So rather than keeping expensive reagents in stock for a test performed once per month or less, hospital labs can send that testing to a reference lab. And automation in the lab has also contributed to cost savings by increasing test capacity and decreasing turnaround times. And finally, screening tests can help lower costs by performing a lower cost test first and potentially eliminating the need for higher cost confirmation testing. So a good example of this is flu testing. If a screening test is performed and is positive for flu A or B, then the provider can treat the, the patient based on those results, rather than waiting for a PCR, which is a higher cost test. In addition to looking at cost savings, laboratory administration must also pay attention to costs associated with lab operation. Cost per test is often calculated for each test run in the lab and especially taken into consideration when new test methodologies are being weighed. Cost per test takes into account direct costs such as reagents, gloves, lab coats, pipettes, pipette tips, and other consumables, as well as indirect costs such as proficiency testing costs or regulatory fees. The overall cost for lab operations will include everything from equipment purchase or lease and equipment maintenance to consumable supplies and personnel costs. So now we're going to move on and talk about common lab equipment. Now when we talk about consumable supplies, we are referring to disposable items such as transfer pipettes, tubes, gloves, disposable lab coats, pipette tips, slides, and so on. When ordering these supplies, we must consider the shelf life or expiration dates, storage conditions, does it have to be refrigerated, frozen, can it sit at room temperature, and then we must consider shipping schedules as well. So common lab equipment found in almost every department in the lab include centrifuges, refrigerators and freezers, microscopes, biosafety cabinets or fume hoods, and so on. And centrifuges can be small, large, or any, any size in between. They must be balanced when in use, and they are calibrated and cleaned regularly. 
Some centrifuges have different inserts that can be changed depending on the tube type being used. The centrifuges are used in most departments in the lab and they can also be used in mycology as long as special aerosol precautions are taken. And refrigerators and freezers are also found in most departments in the lab. And these require temperature to be monitored and logged according to protocol. And this may be every 24 hours, 12 hours, 8 hours, etc. And blood bank refrigerators have more stringent guidelines which require temperature to be recorded constantly. The image here is a temperature monitor that records temperature constantly. You can see the image there with the round piece of paper and those must be saved for a certain amount of time per your accrediting agency. So you guys likely work with microscopes regularly, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, but microscopes must be carried properly if you're going to move them. And they should be cleaned regularly, and maintenance must be performed annually or semi-annually according to the protocols in your lab. Some labs will have fume hoods, but biosafety cabinets will likely be found in the microbiology department. The difference between biosafety cabinets and fume hoods is that fume hoods control gases and protect the operator, where biosafety cabinets control particles and they protect the operator, the environment, and the sample as long as it's a class 2 or above biosafety cabinet. So let's look for a minute at the difference between the two. Fume hoods should be used for hazardous chemicals and volatile vapor vapors. They are meant to protect the user, they have no HEPA filter, and the exhaust goes to the outside of the building. Biosafety cabinets are used to protect the operator, the environment, and the sample. They are used for solid materials, particulates, and infectious biological agents. They must have a HEPA filter and they do not exhaust air outside, but rather recirculate it after the contaminants are removed. There are several different types of water used in the laboratory, specifically type 1, type 2, and type 3, and type 1 is the most pure. Now lab water can be prepared by distillation, deionization, or reverse osmosis. Distilled water is prepared as condensate from heated water. This method removes most minerals, but volatiles such as chlorine or ammonia may remain. This type of water can be used as type 2 water. Deionized water is tap water that has been passed to, through 3 to 4 resin columns. Charged particles or ions in the columns trap impurities in the water and remove, remove them. This method does not remove all organic materials, however. Most notably, it does not remove bacteria. This can be used as type 3 water, but you would want to consider a different type of water for use in microbiology. In reverse osmosis, water is forced through a semi-permeable membrane, which removes most bacteria, particulate matter, and organic materials. However, small levels of contaminants may remain, so this type of water is not suitable for type 1 or type 2 water. Now, reagent grade type 1 water, which is the most pure water, is produced by passing already distilled water over resin columns, then through filters. And this type of water should be used to reconstitute controls and calibrators to prevent any contamination that could affect your lab results. Moving on to measurement containers. These are the more common vessels you will see in the laboratory. The volumetric flask is calibrated to measure one volume. That and the graduated cylinder are the more accurate measuring devices on this list here. The Erlenmeyer flask and Griffin beaker are not as accurate and should only be used when accuracy is not critical. The glass storage bottles can store liquid at a certain volume, and the plastic storage bottles or wash bottles can also store liquids and measure them as well. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, is responsible for standardizing all these measurement devices. And they also standardize time. 
So let's talk about pipettes. There are two broad categories of pipettes. We have semi-quantitative and quantitative. Pasture pipettes and transfer pipettes are examples of semi-quantitative. Examples of quantitative pipettes include serological pipettes, micro pipettes, and macro pipettes. So as we talked about above, pasture and transfer pipettes are both semi-quantitative. These types of pipettes are best used for small amounts of liquid when the amount being transferred is not critical. They are often used to measure by number of drops. So you can aspirate a certain amount of liquid and then drop in as many drops as you need. And the image at the top shows glass pasture pipettes, which work by placing a small bulb on the top. And the bottom image is disposable plastic transfer pipettes commonly used in the lab. And quantitative pipettes are more accurate for measuring and transferring very small volumes. Micro pipettes seen in the bottom image are common in the lab and are considered quantitative pipettes. Serological and more pipettes, as well as micro, macro pipettes, are all quantitative also. The difference in serological and more pipettes is that serological pipettes have measurement markings all the way down near the tip of the pipette. More pipettes do not have markings near the tip and are used for point-to-point -point measuring. Serological pipettes should be measured from the tip of the pipette. Macro pipettes are pipettes used to measure anything greater than one milliliter. This includes both volumetric pipettes and serological pipettes. Now, volumetric pipettes are calibrated to measure one volume only, and serological can be used to measure different volumes with the same pipette. It is important to pipette correctly to maintain accuracy. Some pointers to improve pipetting technique include pre-wetting the pipette tip, making sure the tip is submerged to the proper depth in the liquid, using consistent plunger pressure and speed, and always holding the pipette vertically. It is also crucial to use the appropriate pipette and correct pipette tip. In the image here, you can see how accuracy is affected just by the position of the pipette. So that's all I have for you guys today. I have posted two articles for you to read, one about freezer failure in the hospital and how devastating it can be, and the other about the importance of proper pipetting technique. I have also posted a printable chart with tips to improve your pipetting, and that's just for your reference. If you guys have any questions, please let me know.